Dun dun dun. Dun 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 Hello, welcome back to another Get Projects Done with me, Chris. I'm joined today by Barf and Sheep hanging out with me. We're gonna work on some deep kin. And so as I mentioned previously, I think yesterday's stream, uh gonna try and get all these little thralls all ready to go. And that's the plan today. Now we're not gonna obviously get through them all, as there are nine others to get through. Uh, but we're gonna make some progress. Progress. And get my wet palette out. Just in case we need it. I actually probably could use a little bit of water. You working on anything? Yes. Oh yeah? Okay. Uh, uh working on the orc uh, orc leader dude from the fox oh sweet okay Ooh. very very cool sorry i'm just rehydrating my palate if you hear squishy sounds it's not me doing anything weird damn it <laughs> uh, sorry to let everybody down but yeah not, i'm not uh I'm not doing anything too weird. Not weirder than usual, anyway. All right. There we go. Sit down. Try not to touch any of these little spots. All right. We are ready to roll. Make sure palette's all good to go. The palette seems dark. The palette cam seems dark. Why does it seem dark? Probably did something to it. Let's go here. Here. Something Maybe here. it's just going through that place in life. Could be. Uh, that's better. Ish. It's better than what it was. At least now we can see some of the colors. Mostly. Alrighty, let's get to work. So, first thing I'm going to get started with, uh, I've already done the flesh on a lot of them. I think almost all of them. Giving them a layer of ethermatic blue. Uh, so basically, I'm going to continue that uh, by basically starting off with some black Templar. Citadel Contrast. And we're going to begin laying up uh, the black areas. Uh, so basically what I'm going to do is pretty much the entirety of the legs and anywhere the armor sits, the weapon, and anywhere the metallics are going to sit, uh, those are going to get picked out in black first. And while I try and remember what blue I used for this, the, uh, the I don't know, whatever you call it, the filigree on the cloth... I do not recall what blue that is. I think I used Talisar blue on the outside, the Citadel Contrast, but I don't recall what I used for the f for the edges of it. Yeah, I don't have a freaking clue. No clue. So let's just get to it. Maybe it'll come back to me while I start working. Maybe. Just maybe. Normally, I would recommend uh, using a handle, painting handle of some sort, to you know hang on to the miniature. But because we're working on so many here, uh, we're just gonna you know go through, grab them. Do 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 do. painting my or watering my bristles it's overly thinning the color down a bit it's all right though 
It's not like it's going to ruin my day or anything like that. Having said that. What'd you say you were working on again? My very own uh, small gator pig. Oh, you're working on a small gator pig? Yeah, a small one. Now with this color, I'm not laying it out in the typical fashion what is recommended for Citadel contrast, where basically you lay it on pretty heavily and allow it to do its thing. I'm going to lay it on in layers, build up to the desired result. I guess, mind you, I mean, like if I'm doing them mostly for a tabletop, I guess I don't have to fret it too much I suppose I could just work my way quickly through them it's probably the route I should go just get them done get her done just get her done yeah that's what I'm thinking I've got so many damn projects on the go at the moment that you know Probably should stop being so nitpicky about stuff and just get the shit done. Normally, I don't recommend sitting here painting with your palette, just sitting there in the open like that. But what are you going to do? So what are you going to paint your gator pig? Uh, well, I'm not sure. I'm just figuring it out, figuring it out as I go. Yeah? Yeah, but I'm currently basing, I'm laying down some stick it on scale green for his skin tone. Ooh, sounds fun. Uh -oh. Who's that joining us? Oh, Mr. Boot. What's happening, buddy? Hey. Did you have a good Thanksgiving? Yeah. You weren't going in for all the uh, the Black Friday sales? Mm, not really. No? A couple, but not like crazy. Couple, but not crazy. Yeah. Got a seventy five millimeter figure to paint. That's about it. 75 millimeter. Mm -hmm. Where'd you get it from? Uh, Neko Galaxy. Ooh. Yeah. I plan on buying something from weird something for Malifo, but that's not really a, a sale. Let's buy their shirts off. So. <laughs> gotcha. Mm -hmm. Now, those sales tend to be special edition kits. That's about it. That's what a lot of miniature companies do. They don't really have like a sale. 
I mean, some of them do have tales, and then some just put out limited edition boxes and stuff. Uh, Non-hobby related, I did buy uh, a few things, I would say. That's non-hobby related stuff, so. Well, related to some of my other hobbies, but not miniature things. What are some other hobbies you're into? Uh, outdoors and stuff. Because I go outside, touch grass, so. Uh, rodeos, horse riding, um, hunting, uh, blacksmithing. I said that in the previous. Blacksmithing, uh, yeah. So I bought a, a new pair of, of boots on sale of boots yeah are they cowboy boots yeah for the cowboy oh and then alcohol of course <laughs> apparently some websites have a black friday sales for alcohol oh really wow that's about it though it's just that I just haven't like I don't know I'm not really a big as much as I like to meme about being a red blooded American I don't really do much on Black Friday I'm not like you know I gotta go stand in line at Walmart to get that fucking television it's like whatever I mean I might buy some video games off of Steam uh, that's about it <laughs> yeah this is part of sound cool if there's anything fun on Steam I'll get it um, most, most of the places I shop don't do sales on Black Friday. They'll release like a limited edition mini or they'll release, you know, a special thing. Like my drawing tablet, tablet is the holiday edition for uh, XP pen. And I bought that last Black, Black, uh, last Black Friday because that was the holiday edition they came out with. And it was not really... I guess it's a it's a it's a discounted bundle because it's like a whole bunch of like extra stuff in it, but I don't really uh, I don't really like you know fight to get sales or anything. I'm just like ah uh, whatever. You're not too fired up about bargains. Well, because most of the places I do don't do bargains, or they do sales periodically throughout the year, and their Black Friday. Do you know, sales are not any, like, cheaper. So. Right. Like, Malifaux, for instance, the only reason I want to is because it, or I'm thinking about buying Malifaux this Black Friday is because my gaming group is circling back into Malifaux on their, like, you know, not Warhammer game cycle. And, um, it just happened to coincide with uh, Black Friday. Games Workshop doesn't do sales. They'll do bundles, but their their Christmas bundle boxes aren't out yet. Their their battle forces or whatever the hell we're calling them now, the big boxes. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. Yeah, I might get one of those. Yeah, those tend to be very very much value. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to stay up, you know, clicking refresh on the GW page. If I happen to go on and it's there, I'll buy it. I'm not like, I'm not fussy, I guess. <laughs> a simple man. Yeah, same here. I don't need the uh, 
the latest targets. And a lot of the, you know, independent retailers I shop at are doing Black Friday sales, but they they do specific items and I'll browse the list, you know, in case there's something like I want to buy this if it's on sale, I'll just take advantage of it. But that typically tends to be stuff nobody wants anyway. <laughs> so it's like, ah, oh, yeah. And I see why this is on sale because nobody actually wants it. Right. One of the online retailers I buy Malifo from is selling the Malifo books that nobody really cares about because it's just like lore and stuff in them. Well, some people do care about it, but mostly the people buy it when it comes out. They, you know, a lot of stores just kind of sit on because because uh, Malifo went the way of what uh they still give you physical cards, but they've done basically what uh, Privacy Press has done with War Machine, where it's really about the app. Oh. Uh. Because you, you still get cards with the kits in Malifo to play the game, but everybody just uses the app. One, because it's free now. You used to have to pay for it, but then when they came out with third edition, they just made the app free. And so you get all the cards and rules and stuff that on their app for free, so most people don't even just and they stopped putting rules in the little uh, faction books. All the faction books get fluffed. Everybody just stops buying them. I went to uh, one of my friend's house for Thanksgiving last night, and it was a pretty fun time. That's good. Yeah, the just come back from Peru last week and um, he had pisco with him which is a it's it's like a brandy but it's not a brandy and it's an alcohol like native to Peru like Peruvians came up with this drink and uh, he was making pisco sours all night and it was great pisco sour like a whiskey sour just with like Rotita Pisco. Depending on how you pronounce it, I don't know. Cool. P I S C O. I'll take your word for it. Because pretty good. I don't know if anybody else here drinks whiskey sours, but nope. I, I thought they were better than whiskey sours. <laughs> Whenever I enjoy a whiskey, it's usually just neat. That's how I typically drink my whiskey. But I like yeah, it. I, I, really drink I go neat, neat room temp. Yeah. Yeah, I usually don't put ice or anything in it. I typically get it neat. Occasionally, if I'm having a cigar, which I haven't smoked in a while, I'll have an old fashioned with it. That's about it. Most of the time, my whiskey drinking is neat. With my little whiskey glass. All this talk of whiskey is making me thirsty now. <laughs> yeah. I'm developing a mighty thirst. I have like a little liquor cabinet in my room. And like half of it's whiskey. <laughs> And it gets expensive. I have a, I have expensive taste when it comes to that stuff. <laughs> but I did find a neat Canadian whiskey. Which in one? The U.S. Um, black velvet. Black velvet. Because um, they make a salted caramel whiskey. That sounds fun. And they sell it for like ten dollars in the U.S. Not like a huge bottle, like a little bottle. So. That's been my, when I want whiskey, I don't want to break out the expensive stuff. That's what I typically drink. That or Pendleton. That's what you get on. They call it a Canadian whiskey, but they brew it in the U.S., so I guess it's just a 
they follow the Canadian recipe. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> Does that put maple syrup in it? <laughs> no, Canadian whiskey is really good. Most of them. Yeah, I've had I've had Lord Calvert, and that's about it. Like overseas. I usually go to very deep, rich uh, Scottish whiskies like uh, Glengoyne and those kinds. Right. Uh, a whiskey that is uh, old enough to buy itself. <laughs> it could be good, yeah. I'll buy a Scotty every now and again because they, every now and again, because they get real expensive. Yeah. Most of the time, I'll get Japanese or uh, American, like rye. Kind of last one. So there's this company in the U.S. called Standard Brew. They make a pecan rye whiskey, which I've uh, kind of fallen in love with, as far as like. The stuff I will just drink. I think I have base coated the entire skin. Base coated the entire skin? Oh, my oh, what? Small gator pick. Uh, the leader dude in the Dominion box. Oh, the one riding the Mount Ward. Yeah. Or whatever the hell they call them in Lord of the Rings. I forget what the giant wolf things are called. I think they're called Wards. Yeah, Ward Morgan. Yeah, the uh, gator pick junior. Had him, and I'm sitting there trying to like convert pieces to break up his silhouette so he doesn't look like everybody else. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a cool idea. So I broke one of his uh, I broke his like left horn in half, and I want to kind of jag it up to make it look like it actually like. Cause when you break plastic models, they tend to have like a clean break. So I'm, I'm I got like a hobby knife and get in there. Kind of gouge it to make it look like it was actual like shattered metal. So, might add some more head trophies to them and stuff. Yeah, that's my only complaint with uh, your only complaint with the easy to build like starter sets that BW has. Mm -hmm. And it's a mild complaint because, yeah, it's, you know, easily solved by the per modeler or the person building the models. It's just how all of them, there's not much aside from actually like, taking a hobby knife and green stuff to make them look individual, like, not all the same. Yeah. Because at least with, like, multi-part kits, even though these multi-part, newer multi-part kits are monopose, they tend to have, like, a couple different ways you can build them. And like different weapon op options slightly change the curve. Whereas with like example being the uh, you know the the ward rider, I forget the kill ball from. I think it's the something tooth. Snaggle tooth. I don't know. Um, I've no, I've known a few snaggle tooths. <laughs> it's that beast he's riding. It's something tooth, and it starts with like an S. I think. I don't know. But, um, I'll go with Snaggle Tooth. It goes too. one way. Like, even the other kill boss in that thing, you could give him a flail or a shield. That one, he, he goes his one way, and that's it. And then everybody who has that model, they all look the same. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of annoying when you want a little bit of individuality on your figures and such. I've got a buddy uh, back back up north, and he has massive collections of models, 
and even if it's like a box set with a whole bunch of duders, he'll um, make them all individuals, which is you know pretty crazy considering that he's uh, a hobbyist as well, but he's also a gamer, and so yeah, it's pretty wild. He's got like thousands and thousands of points of fuck for almost all the armies. Pretty crazy. It's fun now. But yeah. I mean, I understand why there's not a lot of options with these easy to build kits. It's the lower the cost for the components, the cheaper. But I just wish sometimes they would have like a different arm or a different head that would break up the silhouette so not everybody's, you know, character from that kit looks exactly the same. Yeah. Just some more little options in them, right? And they did it with the wizard that was in Dominion, the Stormcast Wizard Lady. She had two different heads, one with the mask and one without, and I think they slightly turned depending on what head you take. Yep. That is correct. So even something a little like that just breaks up the silhouette because a lot of people, you know, buy these starter kits. Oh, yeah. Well, Shit. I mean, like a lot of the starter kits, people buy multiples of them just because, you know, fill out their army and shit, right? I mean, nothing wrong with it. I mean, usually, you know, when you get those starter kits, uh, they're good deals. No, it's just a mild complaint I have that I wish they would just, you know, throw in an extra head that's kind of like turned a different way or has a different helmet on it. Yeah. Just to kind of break it up. I wish they would just throw in some heads. <laughs> oh, they have um, made to order some of the old chaplains up. I might get the one with the tower fist. Yeah, I seen that. I got that email a little, a little while ago. I might get that tower fist one. For Christine. I have. I used to have them, and then I, I bought them back in 4th edition and then I just kind of he just got lost over the years I have the Terminator Chaplain the old metal Terminator Chaplain somewhere don't know oh, where the, the tiny don't stout know. dude uh no not that old um he's the current he's the same size as the current Terminator oh okay he's just the now old Terminator Chaplain <laughs> oh somebody on YouTube's I'm not on YouTube am I <laughs> Let me check. I don't think you are. No? Okay. Oh, well, who's that joining us now? Oh, Killer Whale. What's Hello. happening? What's happening? I'm painting my Sidonian Dragoon. Sweet. That's pretty annoying cool. because he's got a million little nooks and crannies <laughs> that are obnoxious to base code, but I think I'm managing. I'm going to be mean, Chris, and tell you that uh, you were streaming on YouTube, but you're not. Oh. No, I'm not? Okay. Not. Kim, uh, hey! Be mean and tell you you were. Elves and I have the red grass... Elves and I have the red grass game handle, among others, that one has the blue tech tops that you can spin. I got 20 caps, so it's great for batch painting. I did put a pick in the Discord for it. Okay, cool. <clears throat> yeah, I got a bunch of them Citadel handles, but my son's still been has been occupying them with his with his toe. So, yeah, I I need to I need to convince him to get back on on his towel because he's got a bunch of other sets to open and put together and stuff. <clears throat> I've just been busy with a lot of other crap these days. <clears throat> Crap, crap, crap. Oh, man. And now it comes the part that I'm actually quite dreading because I've never done this before. Shading and highlighting, but on vehicles. Um, well, I mean, 
do you have a size appropriate brush for it just to make it life a little bit easier oh i'm not it's not about that it's just that uh, i'm not really sure where i should put how am i going to like i know i'm really a fan of the way that heavy metal team baits their vehicles mm -hmm. with basically applying shades to flat panels mm-hmm so that there's a gradient, but I have no idea how I'm going to apply a shade so that it doesn't make a hard, ugly edge. Let's thin it down a bit with a medium or water, um, and then just do what is typically referred to as a recess shade, and you just apply it into the corners of, like, for example, if it's like a, a rhino or something, you apply it. Uh, here, I'm gonna grab a tank. I think I've got one kicking around somewhere. Oh. Also, God, I hate painting orange. It's got, like, no cover coverage whatsoever. You're painting an orange tank? Well, I'm painting Ryza, Adeptus Mechanicus. They have orange as their primary co color. Gotcha. All right, so I got a tank here, and it's... Ignore the... Already what's going on here. It was just covered in contrast Ooh, and stuff. it looks good. <laughs> this was just a rough layering of contrast. That's all this was right here on the top on the side here was a few applications of contrast alternating the brush strokes just to try and get even coverage and it doesn't look very good on this side here uh, i used a sponge to apply the contrast now when i say contrast i mean the the paint not not the, the visual technique yeah. or anything but anyway so like with a tank uh, i don't know what kind of tank you're working on but whatever it doesn't really matter it's like a giant chicken motorcycle walker thing. Sure. <laughs> um, the problem is that it's not, like, it doesn't have a simple shape anywhere. Everything's pointlessly convoluted. Po post a link of what you're what you're talking about, like what you're, what you're painting. Uh, one second. But anyway, um, yeah, a recess shade. It's just, it's really straightforward. Um, I think I actually am going to try using either stippling or sponging, most likely stippling to apply highlights. Yeah, definitely. But I mean, like, you yeah, just... But, like, not the highlights on the edges, because on the edges, I like them sharp, but the highlights just... Okay, I posted the link in your stream, I mean, Twitch chat. Twitch? It, it doesn't show up. like I'm just doing a simple recess shade i'm just going around with black templar around this panel line and it creates already a really fun shadow around the panel and then of course oh yeah i've been doing that for a while yeah i mean um if you thin the color down a bit like if you grab like here we'll use black templar again <clears throat> use something like medium or water I'm just going to slap a little bit under my palette here. Grab a really generous amount into the bristles here. You can see the bristles are really swollen with water. Mm -hmm. And just thin the color way down. Now I'm using contrast here, but this will work with uh, GW Shade Wash and such. And you just, you know, apply it right onto the surface. And it should leave most of your undercolor behind. I actually think I'm going to try doing that with the black because I'm using Corvus Black, which isn't really black, and I love it because it isn't really black. So I think I'm just going to do that all over with the Corvus Black, but with the orange, I'll just do the recesses. Yeah. Now, doing the sponge and using uh, contrast is a really fun way. Uh, do I have a sponge handy? Ah, oh, beauty, I do. Beauty, eh? <coughs> Excuse me. So I'm, just, I'm just using, um, like, pluck foam sponge, you know, like from carry cases and stuff that you just pluck the little chunks out and everything. Anyway, it's, it's just a high-density foam. You can find it in most hardware stores, uh, like the finishing paintbrushes section, just those cheap dollar store things. Anyway, I just tear off a little chunk. Uh, usually I like to go for the odd end where it's like torn so it's like kind of jagged yeah you see the problem with that if you actually uh, if you look at the link i posted where 
in your Twitch chat, but here, I don't know. Just, I can po just post it in the Discord. Like just post it in the Discord. Yeah, just post it in general. Yeah, unfortunately, this guy has no simple shapes anywhere. Like, Let's see, you just it, simply... It's all very convoluted. What are those guys? No. With this, you see here, I'm starting up at the top here and slowly feathering it out towards the bottom. And I have as... a tank coming up in the painting queue that's literally a big box, and I'm probably going to use that for that. Yeah, and depending on where you place the shadow values and your highlight values, you can create a different look. For example, on the side here, if you build your shadows uh, darkest and build downwards, you kind of get a bit of a non-metallic metal look. It's a very interesting look. Of course, you can always go lighter to darker, and that gives you a more conventional kind of look. And it all depends on how intense you uh, you apply your colors is how you know how intense the color is going to be received when you're looking at the model so for example um if i'm like really aggressive and i'm just applying this all over the place you know it'll look you know pretty slapdash on the on the figure as opposed to you know if you're a little bit more deliberate now with contrast oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. with contrast paints it uh it does settle a little bit which is fine so meaning that as you apply it you'll see it looks really intense as you start laying the color down but then as it starts to dry it kind of like you know spreads out and evens out and it doesn't uh, look quite actually as... notice that a lot with just paints in general yeah if you're using like regular um citadel colors or any other opaque colors for that matter uh and using a sponge it it'll depending on how thick you have the paint you could end up with a slight texture so if you work with the paint in a very thick consistency you and you're using that sponge stippling technique uh you'll end up with a slight texture on that surface and if you end up dry brushing you could end up creating a very chalky finish on the figure if you do that but using just straight contrast here no dilution it gives you a much different look whereas if you thin it down you get a, a much more controlled uh, look to the figure. So I'm going to use that same sponge. I'm just going to grab some undiluted contrast. And yeah, let's just start right here. Behind camera here, yeah. What I'm thinking I'm going to be doing is that, you see, I've, uh, you know, Jokera Orange. Well, here's the thing. If you actually look at heavy metal, because apparently I ended up being a very big fan of heavy metal style, did not expect that, but, you know. Is that I actually really like how, in terms of uh, how the Mechanicus armies uh, from heavy metal, they have two types of red. They have the red that goes from Mephiston red to uh, Tau Light Ochre, so that's not relatively, not that much contrast between the base and the extreme highlights and then there's a red where there's a lot of contrast between the base and extreme highlights so corn red going into fire dragon bright and i'm trying to imitate that but with orange so the one that i'm using on tanks is the one with a lot of contrast so i've mixed up a um, darker orange just mix some jacara orange with purple and then i'm taking it up to uh, what is the name is uh flayed one flesh And so you can see how it builds up intensity. Yes. Yes, and it's actually a great. I really love this from the light to dark. Yeah, and so this works pretty well with contrast paints because it's basically thin transparencies that work on top of each other. Now, for example, if we had sprayed this in uh, whatever the ultramarine blue is, spray paint, and then started using a darker contrast color, we can really start to build out the effect. And if you wanted to just catch edges, you could always just dry brush the edges, right? And just catch just the edges. 
or you can be very deliberate and come in with a brush and you know do all sorts of stuff but if you want to keep it really really simple and just kind of you know get them done kind of thing then yeah i would recommend oh, no, using a sponge awesome. or whatever but anyway yeah that's so, just that's just oh, a no, really I'm not fast just looking to get them done that's why i'm going an extra mile i could have just done a very simple paint job with metals and dry brushing on most of my dragoon but i chose not to all right where's that link um boom 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 oh this thing okay yeah so you are you want it that deep red like that? Uh, well, uh, I've actually already, I think I've, uh, basically I did that, but with orange. Okay. So. What was the orange you used? There's no such thing as dark orange in Citadel colors, so, but I've ordered one from Vallejo, and for now I've mixed an approximation of Jacaro orange and purple. Jacaro orange and purple. Interesting. Yes, adding purple to orange darkens it down. Yeah. Actually, um, what you're doing when you add orange to your purple like that is you're, you're like it, it should be shifting towards a gray or even a brown. Um, it's very ochre and I love it. Yeah, yeah. because it, it's the orange and the slight blue uh, in purple. And those are complementary, and when you combine them, they will neutralize, which typically in light gives you gray, but uh, in paint it gives you brown. Whenever you mix two complementary colors. So if you took yellow and purple, you'll get a brown. Green and red will give you brown. Yellow or uh, orange and blue gives you brown. Now, depending on intensity, it'll vary how intense the brown will be. And of course, you know, if you have more red to it, then you end up with more of a red brown. If you have more yellow in it, then it ends up yellow brown. If you end up with more blue, it'll be a darker brown. But yeah, it's pretty straightforward. But um, yeah, if you're just working with like um, opaque, regular opaque colors, yeah, stippling it for large surfaces, straightforward. Um, even getting your getting your hands on some stippling brushes, some brushes where the you know they have the just you know they're just designed just for the stippling technique. And I actually have a really good uh, brush just for stippling. It's not intended to be stippling. It's intended to be a dry brush. It's just a regular dry brush from the Army Painter, but the bristles are so so firm and thick that it works wonderful. Yeah. Yep. That's that's pretty much it, man. All right, I think the wash has dried. Let me go and finish my uh, Dragoon. The problem with that is that, unfortunately, there is no place for on my desk for me to both work and uh, be on my PC. So I kind of have to put it behind me while I work. But I will be with you in spirit. <laughs> okay. Thanks a lot for the advice. I'll absolutely use that on the tank that's a box. It's that bathtub tank, I, I assume, for the Mechanicus? Oh, yeah, the, the crawling one? No. Yeah. I can't remember what the hell that tank's called. Yeah, it looks like a big bathtub. Toaster in a bathtub. <laughs> Toaster in a bathtub? Jeez, please. Yeah, because the, <laughs> the Mechanicus... The toasters. Yeah. I don't know. My son. The tank that I'm talking about, the Scorpius, really does look really boxy. So it is kind of like a bathtub. What is the Scorpius? Uh, Scorpius Disintegrator and Dune Rider. Yes, the tank of Mechanicus that's actually a tank. A tank that's actually a tank? Yeah, because they have like oh, a walker thing, a bunch of robots, and then there's a tank that's a tank. 
Yeah, the hover tank. Yeah, that's that's a bathtub. Upside down. You know what that reminds me of? Because like I'm from Russia and in Russia we had back in the nineties an extremely popular an extremely popular brand of like what's it called? It's like a swimming pool, but instead of digging a hole, you just put this thing on your lawn. It was called a porkable pool, and it looked like Scorpius Dune Rider, except turned upside down. Because it's square, and it has this, like, rim at the bottom, segmented rim, and that's exactly what this portable pool had at the top. I'm not sure if I'm explaining it. So, so you could take that... Uh tub, flip it upside down, and then make yourself a uh, cosplay tank. Yes, essentially. Some I don't your lap, though. Some cosplay back tanks. In, back in the 90s. Also, please wish me luck, guys. I have a very important experiment tomorrow. Does it involve gamma rays? Uh, no, it doesn't. But it does involve... Uh, Superheroes. Uh, it involves analyzing if the genetic variation in pigs, intestinal epithelium cells, protect them from E. coli invasion. Sounds ex interesting. Well, biology is kind of my passion, aside from modeling, so. If it works, it potentially could lower the amount of antibiotics in your food. Hypothetically. sounds cool, but they're not. But they sound cool. They're not. <laughs> well, if you're ever doing any uh, gamma ray experiments, uh, you let me know. I'll absolutely keep you updated. Why? No. Why? In case you turn green. In case you turn green, or you figure out how you turn yourself green, and then you can make me green. Why would you want to be green? The fucking Incredible Hulk, man. And the massive wang you would get. To be fair, it's actually a protein that glows green. <laughs> I got you. Literally protein. called green fluorescent protein. And you could, in the near future, genetically modify people to express this protein. Oh, they make cats that glow in the dark green already. Making cats glow in the dark. What kind of sick animal wants yeah. to do that? Yeah, genetically modified cats, they glow in the dark. What sort of crazy person wants that? I have no idea. To be fair, if you have a glow in the dark cat, you're never going to trip over it. When it's bedtime and you go to your bed and the lights are off and your cat's right in front of you. How's it gonna hunt? <laughs> well, I mean, if it's a domestic cat, how is it gonna hunt? Why would it want to hunt? It gets food out of a bag. Cats like hunting. It's instincts. They can't help it. I mean, it's actually an ethical concern, but not in a way you'd think. Cats like hunting, and they kill a lot of native birds. So what if we, so hypothetically, a glow-in-the-dark cat would be better for ecology because it just wouldn't be as successful in hunting. 
Right. But he his DNA has been meddled with, and what if he creates offspring and introduces some new, weird, strange variant? What do you mean? What did I say? Like, what do you mean in terms of weird, strange variant? Yeah, it's gonna, if it's gonna have an offspring with a regular cat, then eventually, then offspring's gonna glow in the dark, too, but weaker, and eventually we're gonna have the, both the, the Grizzler and the Grizzler be so rare and delusive that they're not even doing anything anymore. How, how is, how is DNA dilu- diluted? How, how does DNA dilute? Uh, well, multiple ways. Because usually you have two copies of a gene. But you can also mm-hmm. have one copy. And if you have one copy, you're going to produce less of a gene. Because the cats produce, have one copy of a gene, they produce less. And then there's just going to be random mutations introduced into that gene. That's will start mocking the protein off the protein product and the protein when it gets mocked up it fluoresces more weakly because the structure is not as good for fluorescing so there is that but that's over centuries doesn't sound like a very good idea to me could you just leave the cats alone (laughs) well like the thing is is that i i'm I'm in the camp of things are really fucked up as it are, and we shouldn't be fucking around with the DNA of animals. Because I'm we. I'm a biologist. I'm in the camp of let us understand life so we can better. Replicate it. Yeah, I get it. Not replicate it, but like make things better for everyone. How is, like, how, is, things, how, is how is messing with the genes of a cat world. better for everyone? Nobody's going to produce these things on an industrial scale. It was a one-off experiment. Sure. I'm talking about stuff like what I'm doing tomorrow, because, for example, if we manage to genetically modify pigs so that little piglets are resistant to E. coli infections, just naturally, with no antibiotics involved, it's going to be better for everyone. Especially the consumers, because that there's going to be less what? antibiotics in your blood. Why do why do pigs get E. coli? Because they live in shit. Sure. Why doesn't uh, everything get E. coli infections? E. coli is everywhere. Okay. You can't avoid E. coli infections. You can only resist them. Right. I mean, you can if you like put and things so, into individual isolated boxes. And so if death, and if an animal is resistant, then E. coli will come back stronger when it mutates. No. Not really, because uh, there won't be any, how should I say this, E. coli doesn't infect only pigs. So if we were to genetically modify every single organism that it can infect, then yes, it would come back stronger. But because we're modifying just the pigs, and not everything else, and just the domestic pigs, not the wild swine or anything, there won't be an environment for E. coli to actually evolve. What is the, what is the environment f- that uh, propagates E. coli? Shit. <laughs> right, but but what is that what is that situation common? Like what what would make E. coli so dangerous that it can just overtake, you know, a population? What what are the conditions? Well, if it were, uh, well, if it were like uh, like E. coli is a pathogen that has many hosts, a ton of them. Right. A lot of species. So. Uh, if one host uh, host develop resistance, it's got all the rest of the hosts to infect in the meantime. So there won't be much selection pressure on it to evolve hypervirulence because hypervirulence is very costly. You spend a lot of energy producing those proteins responsible for it to for you to to be a very dangerous hyperbot. And why bother producing uh, you know those hypervirulence proteins if you can just infect some other hosts in the meantime while wasting less energy right but see my my point i'm getting at here is that <clears throat> with e coli and having to 
uh, engineer and adapt the DNA of an animal so that it becomes more resistant towards it um, seems more of a band-aid solution as opposed to removing how E. coli becomes a problem amongst that population. How can we possibly remove E. coli as a problem? That's unfeasible. Well, well how, does it po how does it propagate? Just uh, through pretty much everything, E. coli is just generally in the environment of everything. Unless you establish a perfectly sterile room, like in a hospital or somewhere, you can't eliminate E. coli. Okay. It's so it, that, uh, most uh, creatures, when they're adults, are resistant to it, and you don't even notice if you get infected because there are no symptoms. But, um, uh, but in terms of domestic pigs, little piglets, after they're born, for the first couple of weeks, they don't have this resistance yet because they don't have the body mass, they don't have the robustness, they don't have the, just the sheer toughness to withstand it. So neonatal E. coli infections are a thing that's quite dangerous. But if a pig survives for the first few weeks, then it's going to be perfectly fine for the rest of its life. Okay, so then why does its gene have to be uh, altered? Because we want as many pigs to survive the first few weeks of their life as possible. Why would we want that? What if there's other defects associated with those pigs that... Um, makes them more or less susceptible to future diseases or even other mutations. We haven't actually done this analysis yet, but rest assured we're going to do that before we actually start modifying anything. We're going to analyze this genetic variant that we're working with for other effects and consequences, but from data analysis we did so far, it just affects the susceptibility to E. coli, nothing else. Right, but like if you make... Um... A resistant pig to E. coli, and then E. coli, uh, E. coli, oh fuck, I can't even say the word anymore. Does it not encourage it to adapt and become stronger to the point where it affects humans in a way that was not intended? Theoretically, yes, but not in this particular case. For uh, you to create an environment for a pathogen to become stronger, you need to genetically modify all of its hosts. But we're talking about changing the DNA of the pig. Yeah, but uh, here's the thing. E. coli doesn't just infect pigs. E. coli infects everything. Right. So, pigs so, so if pigs uh, become e. very... E. Right, but my point being is that pigs, if they're very resistant, the E. coli changes in that when it, how it affects the pigs because it wants to infect the pigs, but becomes a mutant strain that can affect other animals, up to and including humans. That is astronomically unlikely to happen if we only modify the pigs. If we were to modify every single living creature on Earth that can get affected with E. coli, then yes, there will be pressure for E. coli to mutate, but if we just modify the pigs, no. See, I, again, I'm. it feels more like human meddling to me. To be playing with these genomes, then, I mean, re point, then removing the, uh, the danger and the conditions of which these animals are treated, and how these bacteria propagate. That's the point I'm getting at. It's a uh, it's a band-aid solution. Technology and start being meddling. It's always meddling. How is building a hut out of rocks not meddling? It's for survival. But you're not changing. You're, you're only changing uh, the immediate environment around. But digging massive holes in the ground to extract ore is a vast damaging process. So yeah, it's a damaging process. See, it's human meddling because we're always trying to control the environment, and things become progressively worse because the environment, nature always looks for a zero sum it always balances so if something becomes a little too uh, nature isn't, isn't like 
uh, force. It's not an alien intelligence or anything. It's just a bunch of interconnected processes. Right. There's billions and billions of processes. You tug yeah. at the thread of one thing, it could unravel the entire tapestry. I, I mean, yes, hypothetically, but that's if we medley it. That's we. That's if we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> okay. In this particular case, we're not. Uh, you know, we're not just irradiating things with gamma rays and seeing if they survive. Well, we specifically hope. found uh, genetic variants that already comes from pigs, because some pigs are more resistant to E. coli infections than others. So we just tried to analyze what if we were to see what makes those resistant pigs tick. So we zeroed in on a genetic variant that's already from the pigs. And we're trying to see if it can work. And we're just trying to see that it's this genetic variant that works. Because if it works, what's going to happen is it will probably just start breeding the pigs with this genetic variant. So probabilities. I'm hearing a lot of probably probabilities. Oh, science is all about probabilities. Right. So you don't know the actual outcome of meddling. Not with certainty, but there is a difference between probably and probably. <laughs> so again, you're tugging at threads, and you could unravel something uh, I dangerous. Would, uh, I would argue against that, because uh, <laughs> there are... Uh, how can I say? Just because we can't say anything with 100% certainty, just because we can't say everything with 100% right. certainty doesn't mean we can't say like 95% of things with 100% certainty. So then what are the things we can control? In, in what? In anything. Like, well, for example, we've managed to create battery farming in the last few decades, or maybe last century, I'm not quite sure when it started. That's been working just fine. The problem with battery farming is the is animal welfare and the amount of waste it produces, but the actual process works just fine. Sorry, I had to dip out real fast. Uh, what did you, what did you say last? I said that I'm not quite. A, I used battery farming as an example. We can uh, create processes that work with nature. Battery farming works just fine. The problem with it is that uh, it produces a lot of waste. But even then, right now, there are multiple but, experiments. But farm farming, farming doesn't yeah. produce a huge amount of waste. The only yeah. reason farming produces a large amount of waste is because of the practices of huge consumption. Profit. No, battery farming does produce a lot of waste in general. Why Why do we have to have so many pigs? I don't know. Don't ask me. I'm <laughs> mostly chicken. <laughs> the last bird that I, the last meat that I ate just today was a duck. Duck's good. We have a guy who shoots them in our closure. He sold me half a uh, duck, and it was pretty big. Maybe it was a goose. I'm not quite sure. I don't understand the point of meddling, because uh, isn't the whole point of human science is to meddle in stuff? We no. meddle in thermodynamics to invent cars. We meddle in... No. Rock formations to create bricks. No. That wasn't meddling. That was utilizing well, the environment. I mean, what's the definition of meddling? Well, going into something and ch making changes to it that it didn't need or it didn't ask for. How do you determine that? Exactly. That it didn't need those changes. Because they don't. If little piglets are dying from E. coli, wouldn't they want those changes to not die from E. coli? What are the What are the conditions that those piglets live in? I 
actually doesn't depend on condition. It's just regular. I mean, it's pretty good conditions, actually. Just the regular farm conditions, from what I can understand. I kind of uh, assume just as much that it is regular conditions. But that does not mean that the regular conditions are good. No, no, no. I meant the regular conditions, not even battle farm conditions, but like the stereotypical individual farm conditions where pigs have a place to run around and so on. Free range pigs is what you're talking about. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, my God. I forgot the term. I'm not very familiar with free range pigs. Farms, uh, it's very easy to actually, you know, lower the infection rates. You just space the animals out a bit and so on. There is a big initiative about that in the Netherlands where I'm at. Yeah. But what about the pigs that, you know, you can't realistically improve conditions beyond three star free range as rated by the government. Three star already means that pigs have everything they have professionally need, but Do unfortunately they? the E. coli has been a pretty big thing lately. in terms of causing piglet deaths, mostly because, I don't know, just the climate, really. So we don't know, then, why piglets are dying like that. We do know it's E. coli infection. Eat less meat, that's the thing to do in my opinion. Right. It's not eat less meat though. Because I mean you still need a caloric intake. Uh, and you know, meat is an important part of that. What is the problem is the root of the problem, which is how these animals are treated. These large pens where they're in close proximity to each other, piglets and pigs and everything like that, and they're just in a big barn, and they're just fattened up, so they're rolled out to slaughterhouses and processed. And then even all these processes that go on within uh, slaughterhouses breed bacteria and viruses and such. Slaughterhouses are, are a big problem. The only reason why we have these is because of the gigantic meat grinder that is our current fast food industry, our consumption, our overconsumption of these animals. I really don't understand the whole point of it. Like, what's the point of producing food that people don't even eat? Right, exactly. Because it's capitalism. It is, it is the, the system of greed at which we all exist in. And that is why we have all these problems. You wouldn't need to reinforce a pig's DNA if you changed its living conditions to more appropriate to better conditions where they're spaced out and they're free. The piglism and so on. I'm not talking about pigs. In this particular case, in this particular experiment, we're not dealing with battery farm pigs. It's free range pigs. It's just that even free range pigs still die a lot from E. coli. Sure. Why pigs have such large litters. Sure eight to nine but like something only four survive on average and that's because it's the piglets are very vulnerable to infections in their first weeks of life and one of the big components is e coli the pigs have evolved to counteract this by just breeding more piglets than the disease can kill so then it, that doesn't sound like there's a problem with pigs so why mess with their dna it does sound like a problem with pigs it's an imperfect solution what if you were to make pigs more resistant to E. coli instead of just having more pigs. Right, and then the pigs that become more resistant to E. coli creates an E. coli that is more resistant. We have been over this multiple... Well, I know. We're, go we're going in circles at this point. Yes. And I'm saying that unless we... Not with E. coli. Like, I would have serious problems with modifying... A an organism that's a sink that's the exclusive host to a pathogen like what is it i don't know what's a rare disease 
AIDS. Prepared for a dump for a uh, type of heart worm that only infects dogs. A parasitic worm that only ever is found in dogs, not in any other species. If it were to modify dogs to be resistant to this infection, then yes, there would be a selection pressure on this worm to evolve hyperviral to become very a more infectious parasite. But with pigs, it's quite different. The E. coli doesn't, the E. coli is not even necessarily a parasite. It can do other things. It can just live in the environment. It is parasitic not because it's an obligatory parasite, but because it's an opportunistic parasite. When it encounters a host that's resistant to it, what happens is that E. coli simply doesn't infect this host, but it keeps living in the environment. And because it keeps successfully living in the environment, because it's not an obli obligatory parasite, there's no pressure on it to evolve. Infections and deaths are collateral damage to E. coli life cycle, not because it's an actual parasite. Still sounds like meddling to me. Well, I guess I'm just a biologist. <laughs> we take science to live in things. Well, it's it's a question of, you know, why do we f always feel this need that we can control the environment? To make it better, I suppose. I would define better. Ah, that's an ecumenical question. <laughs> well, you're operating under the assumption that you're making things better. Yes. I argue it isn't. It's more just human meddling. Most humans meddle it into something if it brings them no benefit. Because it's about control. Nobody's going to spend a lot of time, uh, effort, and money on something that brings them no profit. Exactly. Or no benefit. I don't. So then it. it. So then it is a monetary gain that we're concerned with. Yeah. Okay. That's all I need. Plus that pig. Plus that pigs mean. We have to breed fewer pigs in cycle. It brings down the cost massively, the waste decreases. Because you still need to spend a lot of money and effort feeding a pig so that it can breed. But what if half of its litter dies? Then you have to do it all over again. Imagine if all of its litter survives. And you don't have to and then you don't have to breed them. Right. So again, the only reason to, to make the changes is profit. Not really, actually. In this case, it's also uh, it's also just general improvement to the production capacity. So there's less waste. There's less... Yeah, you're saying production and waste. Those are all geared towards profit. Yes. But, I mean, what is your point? What would be... What should we do instead with the pigs if we can't make them die less for conventional use? Ethical treatment of the animals. And uh, stop, 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 stop the overconsumption. Think, go hang out at the closest fast food joint to you and watch how much food gets thrown out. That's profit. You can only have high profit with high waste. That's how capitalism works. I would argue against that, but that's how current capitalism works. But current capitalism doesn't really work. Current capitalism is going to kill us all. Yeah. I think there is going to be a change after the generation that's formed that dies off. Yeah. Time advances at the speed of Twitter. <laughs> I mean, right now, in this country, Canada... The West Coast and East Coast are eroding away into the water. In BC, there's massive floods that have knocked out the roads, the train tracks, everything like that. On the East Coast, there's tons of flooding. It's all eroding. Why? Because 
through meddling and deforestation, the surf, the topsoil is just falling away. If there's no more topsoil to grow crops, little piggies aren't going to eat unless they start eating themselves. The entire system has to change. We're part of that change. Yes, we are. But when we act, but when we're active in affecting that change, it only changes when you make that change. But I am making that change. Not to the not to the genome. I'm not talking about the genome. I'm talking about the society, because. Again, I mean, like... Also a societal thing, like, for example, how it's usually done on farms to prevent big time from E. coli, antibiotics in injections, on gluten, to the point where uh, the meat is actually detrimental to absolutely everything and the waste is toxic to the environment because it contains so many antibiotics. With arm modifications, there's going to be exponentially less antibiotics, so waste is going to be less toxic and there's going to be less waste. Well, you'll have to show me the studies then. Oh, I'll absolutely send you the study after it gets published. Here's the thing. One of the main things why genetic modification is better is because it creates a natural defense in the organism. That's not natural. You modified it. It is natural. No, you modified it. Nature, but... You modified it. It's not natural. You modified it. a different it. definition of natural then. Well, well, what's natural? Well, what's natural then? I'm sorry. What's natural then? Well, everything that is produced by living organisms that is related to them, and I don't quite like the word natural. I shouldn't have used it, but it creates an organic and internal defense inside the animal that works perfectly fine with within its own organism. It doesn't create toxins. Well, that's a pretty tall order. That's a lot of modifying. Actually, not really. Sometimes you just need to tweak one or two things. Because what happens is that the bacteria, for it to connect to epithelial cells, it has to attach to a very, very specific molecule. And in that molecule, there's like two amino acid residues that really count. The genetic variant that's found contains alterations to these residues that don't actually affect the function of the protein but make it impossible for bacteria to attach to it. It makes it impossible for the bacteria to attach. Yes. So what stops the, the bacteria from changing so it can attach? The fact that the E. coli is not an obligatory pathogen, it doesn't need to live inside of living, inside of living animals. Is a coli the only danger to pigs? Will go live in the environment. Is E. coli the only pathogen that affect pigs? Is E. coli the only thing, thing that affects pigs? It can do everything. Is E. coli the only thing that affects pigs? No, but it's a pretty big thing. So, everything that makes up the entire strand of DNA that makes up a pig's DNA and you want to edit a certain section of its DNA to make it more resistant to E. coli how do you know how do you know that that doesn't open the door to making it susceptible to other infections because we look at the gene that is affected and the gene isn't involved in any other known infection so you just solved pig infections we solved pig E. coli infections. What about infections from other bacteria and viruses? If you're if you're editing one well, gene, solved, isn't it? what? Because there's been a lot of like it take it took something like five years of work for a gene to solve just the one infection by one pathogen in one animal. And in this case, it's not even a pathogen as much as it's just a thing that can... It's not like a pathogen that it is specifically infects pigs. It's just a pathogen that, for 
opportunistically type space. It doesn't need to. It just can. Yeah, it still sounds like meddling to me. We're talking about pathogen like coronavirus, the one that's an obligatory pathogen, the one that's rapidly mutating, then there's no way we can biologically stop this. No. There's no way we can modify a human for them to make him resistant. It's the same way why we don't have a vaccine against the flu that works for longer than a couple years at most, because the flu, the flu mutates that fast. Because it has to, because the only option it has is living inside humans. But E. coli doesn't have to live inside space. It can just live in the environment. So if it can't infect something, there is no pressure in it to, well, become more infected. It's a very specific set of conditions, yes. Hello? Hello? Oh, right, sorry. Thought the audio was off. Ah, I don't even know why I'm arguing with people about equally. I don't know why either. I have a sneaking suspicion that the topic has uh, outlasted its life. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> My work keeping it. No, but your your passion about your work that's that's fine. I'm actually very happy that I managed to get into this academia thing because it's like working uh, behind the lab uh, bench for me is as fun as working on miniatures. Sure. I, I get it. It's fulfilling. It's what you want to do. It's what you're passionate about. I fully understand. I can't imagine working in an office. I tried and it was killing me on the inside. Well, that's... <laughs> that's... <laughs> a similar thing, but different. But yeah, I get it. I'm not meant to be sitting in cubicles and processing data. Working with even data, it was uh, well, the, the, I was working with a team of translator, but not as a translator. It was like basically managing translation orders, which was a very stupid and menial job. Well, yeah, <clears throat> that's that's the and world, the only man. Great you get was like five minutes behind the water cooler while you brought yourself another glass of water. Kim, when I was a kid, it was snow here from October, and now it's the end of November, and that the ocean temperature rising, the climate gets warmer. By our rape of the planet and the overconsumption of the Western world and the pollution from the third world countries, they can't move forward with these with their crushed economy. No, it's 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 not good. I mean, again, you need a, a you need a dramatic overhaul of the way we currently view our place in the world. Still think that's going to happen, but you know, with generational change. Mm, we, I, we might not be have the generations. We don't. I don't think we have the time that we think we have. Oh, I mean, the change is already happening. Right. But like the generational change, that's what I mean. The, there might not be future generations, man. That's my point. Well, there will be. It's just the generational change we need is already happening. Is it? Yes. And what's the change? Well, the whole new attitude towards uh, ecology and science and whatnot, and even capitalism in general. The people who still love the old systems are basically just old guys in the 70s or 80s. So they're the, dying by the year. So the old ways are not good? 
Well, at least in science, no. What's wrong with the science? Not old ways. I'm not talking about old ways. I'm talking about the specifically the ways that created this rapacious capitalism, which are from the baby boomer generation, specifically the very early baby boomer generation, the it's, ones that got born in the 50s. It's easy to blame them, but it was even before them. I wouldn't say it was. It was quite different, I would think. <clears throat> Scientist miniatures. It's like, how do you come up with this shape so complex? computer added design missing technology Chris, if I could bother you with one more question. What would you say is the better base code for leather? Dryad bark or Rhinox hide? It all depends. Um, for leather, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, it's, there's many different directions you can go for leather. Rhinox hide, I like, I, I like Rhinox. Yeah, I Rhinox Hide, I would recommend because it has a nice warmth quality to it. It's got a little bit, little bit of red to it. And so mm -hmm. for leather, I think it works really well. Um, whereas something like Dryad Bark, it's a nice dark red or dark brown, but uh, it's not as saturated feeling. So it's it works. Again, it, it all depends on what other combinations of colors are on the model that it has to fit into. Okay. Right? Majority color of this thing is for with black, which is a very cool one. It's mostly black. Yeah, I would go with a slightly with warmer, black. warmer brown. A uh, bit of a um, like if you're using Rhinox hide. Yeah, I'd, I'd recommend basing it in Rhinox hide. Okay, well then I'll use Rhinox hide. Thank you so much. I tend to use uh, dry dry bark for like old crusty leather. Yeah. Well, again, it, it, it's entirely situational, right? I mean, it's, yeah. you know, hell, you can even mix your own brown and, you know, use that for leather. I mean, you know, it all depends. And not all leathers are the same. And, you know, yeah, it's all about what look you're after. And I think that's, I think where a lot of people kind of get, kind of, um, they hit a bit of a bump because they're, they're worried about the color that it should be and not really what kind of look they're after like are they looking for a natural kind of leather or are they looking for you know i don't know colored leather like you know what i mean like it all depends on the other colors that play as well on the figure right? you can't have colored leather the biggest problem is like how would you indicate that this is a colored leather and not colored something else well how can you tell when looking at it in a photograph or, you know, in a movie? Good question. I have no answer. Yeah. It's just, it just has that look. It's something that our eyes perceive. And, you know, it's, it's not really straightforward, but, you know, our eyes read it a particular way. Uh, which is probably why you see so many people these days, whenever you're depicting leather, oftentimes it'll have a lot of cracks in it or the edges are worn. You'll have, see scratches and, you know, like the weather looks really old. Whenever people are painting leather, to indicate to the viewer that it's leather, you go through those certain steps to weather it, essentially, to make it look like a certain way so that the person viewing it says, ah, that's leather. I... Even if it was yellow, brown, blue, red, whatever. Yeah, I think that's... Yeah, 
That's actually a good point. I'll think about that. But yeah, I mean, to, to convey the sense of texture is really what is uh, the key element in that. I just started doing that with the robes of my guys because whenever I apply highlights to the robes, which are supposed to be flossed, I'm not using straight lines. I'm doing little back and forth chevrons. Oh, I see what you mean, yeah. Yeah. I really love the effect. Yeah. Well, I mean, again, like if you're happy with the effect, then yeah, keep doing it. You know? Don't worry about what you're seeing in magazines or on websites or whatever. Do whatever makes looks right to you, to whatever effect you're going for. And don't worry about what other people are going to interpret it as, especially if you know you're just painting for fun or gaming, or what have you. You know, just do it for you, man. That's it. I mean, originally I wanted to just paint an army for tabletop, but the more I paint, the more I realize that I like painting itself. Sure, it's fun, especially since. And the tabletop meta changes so fast that you need to be really crazy good at painting to manage to paint stuff. Well, in time with the changing. Yeah. Well, you can just be an old first. Now it's Anki army, not just a fast attack alpha strike army anymore. Yeah, I'm. I'm not too worried about metas. I don't really concern myself with that stuff mostly because it, it changes so rapidly and ultimately it's it's a waste of time and when you get older you don't like wasting your time in fact wasting your time is is a huge annoyance uh green leaf terrain hi chris i'm so happy you're stre streaming <clears throat> pass the butter <laughs> green leaf Mutant generation will be the best generation. Rise of the mutants. Yeah. I mean, one could argue that, um, you know, it's always occurring. We're always mutating. The human genome is always changing, so we're always mutating. Yeah, it is. But frankly, one of the best examples is that some people in the past two decades managed to mutate their resistance to AIDS virus. HIV. Interesting. They're in for a butt fucking. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> We've gone too long without dick jokes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to provide. Yeah, thank you. It was well timed. In fact, uh, that might even earn a bit of a golf clap. <laughs> don't understand what the hell the golf club is the golf I clap the golf club Quiet clap. Oh, hey boop yeah it's been a while since we heard from boop too I was letting you two have at it with your discussion while I'm sitting here just looking at something <laughs> well I mean like like I get where killers uh, you know his the position of you know, wanting to create a better world, but unfortunately, you know, uh, all I ever see is is human meddling in that regards. I, it's a uh, this <clears throat> it's this conceit that the world has that this world is for us. It is not. painting scrim why do so many imperial things have so many scrims that I couldn't tell you design choices it's like Eldar why, why are Eldar always asymmetrical I think Eldar is asymmetrical well imperial stuff is mostly symmetrical but like an Eldar details are off one side to another, right? Oh, really? Never noticed. Yeah, you'll get some, like... Usually it's like the placement of the gemstones and shit like that. that you get those, you know, 
situations. Yeah. Yeah, then that's not quite as smooth as, you know, I mean, like, in comparison, I mean, to an Imperial tank, I mean, tons of smoothness, right, to it. I mean, Imperial tank is literally just the ball that's yeah. been hit with an ugly stick, I swear to God. Yeah. <laughs> Imperial crap is crap. The skull has been, has been made by the tall Tau gang. Seriously, am I the only one who's actually bothered by how ugly the Lehman Rock tank is? Ah, uh, it's not too bad. I, I dig a Lehman Russ because it's kind of like the old classic World War One. They just take everything cool that's cool about tanks, and then you take it out, and then you build the tank out of the rest, and that's Lehman Russ. Like, holy crap. <laughs> yeah. And the worst part is it's in the ridiculously useful tank on the tabletop. And just in the lore. Kim, but it should have happened in the 70s. We're already past the point where we can fix the damage we've done to the planet. I use so many browns for leather and I do several types of leather and use the same techniques with, or techniques with different colors and get a pretty nice leather. Yeah, exactly, you know. Um, again, it's really, I think, w w to go back a couple pages about the leather, yeah, it's all about creating that texture, right? Because, you know, uh, a brand new leather purse, whether it was brown, black, red, blue, whatever, brand new, you can't tell it's leather just by looking at it, right? It's not until it's actually got some wear on it, it's got crinkles going on, it's, you know, edges and all these things, right? And that's when it starts to really look like leather. That's what I do, especially with, like, chaos. Like, with my Minotaur, brown. But then I took the edges and I did a straight highlight. I did a... And I took a flesh tone and I did vertical... Yeah, the, like, little scratches and everything? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's that's... That, that makes the most sense because again when we're painting this stuff right we want it to, to be legible visually right so yeah. well i had to pick up my eldar models and stare at them i just said they're asymmetrical and they are indeed asymmetrical yeah and six it's not like you know bombastic with it but like with Banshee's perfect example. They have more so they don't have right shoulder blades. They don't that have has left. more and it's a symmetrical. And it's gonna be a miracle. And, uh, guardians have like little little stones. They might have it on one shoulder but not the other. And it's not the same shoulder throughout all. We're busting out Turbo Dork here for some fun. So, I'm going to use uh, Kirkow. Sirocco? I don't know. Sriracha. Sriracha? We're going to use Sriracha here. It's a really wonderful color. I love this color. This greeny, turquoisey, 
type of yeah. color. You know what? Go fuck yourself. No. You know what? Fuck, <laughs> fuck you and your fucking like opinion. The cocktail color because there's the cocktail that everybody's heard of. I'm sorry, what, cocktails. Well, like the blue Buddha style thing, like the cocktail that everybody's heard of. I haven't. I haven't. But I live under a rock. <laughs> By chance. I live. On top of a rock. But not by choice. <laughs> you know, where? <laughs> no, I, I was making a dumb joke. It wasn't a good joke. Alright, so we're taking this and we're gonna begin laying out onto the weapons and such and the armor. Uh, -bum 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 -bum. Yeah. Yeah. I like this color. You might like the drink too. I might. I might. I might, Rabbit, you I should, might. You should drink that paint and see if it tastes like the drink. I should. <laughs> Don't tempt me, I might. I'm stupid enough you to do might. it. You might. might, you might, 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 might. Do it. <laughs> no ball. Yeah, no balls. I don't wonder what do you people use for your water pot? I brought like a deacon I brought like a deconditioned What do you mean you people? Your bottle from the lab and it's working perfectly. <laughs> <I'm Chris. laughs> you people. What do you mean you people? I use uh, my old band mug. It's just that I try to save as much water as possible, so I just reuse water again and again and again and again. And the more water you have, the more you can reuse it before it becomes too muddy. Oh, I see, yeah. Uh, uh, I... But it, it dilutes. Yeah. I change my water fairly often, but I'm not that hung up on my water usage but it does sit for a while i mean i re I, I redid this i mean like you can see it's it's dark and murky and i i changed this out a few days ago usually whenever i start playing around with um solvent based paints enamels shit like that that's when i usually will switch out the water if i'm going back to like water-based acrylics and such especially if i know i'll probably end up licking a brush then yeah, I definitely will switch out the water. Tasty enamel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you ever want to get out of your brush ha uh, brush licking habit, that's the best way to do go about it. Start playing around with uh, solvent based paints and alcohol based and you know what have you. you can get you out of that habit right quick. What do you mean solvent based paint? Like. Like enamels or like Tamiya with it. It has like an alcohol uh. binder like that because uh, typically to clean those brushes well you got to use like a thinner or an alcohol or well if uh, it's if it's an enamel base or lacquer base then you're using well lacquer thinner or um, mineral spirits to uh, clean your brush of course you shouldn't be using your good sable hair brushes to play with those paints but that's beside the point um, but yeah if you want to get out of your brush uh, licking habit playing with those paints yeah definitely will get you out of it because it only takes a couple of times of tasting turpentine or lacquer thinners in your mouth and going oh my god i think i fucking poisoned myself and yeah but what if i like it well if you like it well then fucking carry on i mean fuck <laughs> <laughs> who am i to tell somebody who am i to stop somebody from poisoning themselves and if you if you're into it if it's your bag well then you know carry on Oh, I did have a good, uh, good taste of the Tamiya. Tamiya does taste didn't good. Enjoy, uh, didn't enjoy it that much. <laughs> it smells like chemical candy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's pretty brutes. 
I mean, the, the transformative thing. It's really weird. Define weird. Me. Like, it smells <laughs> out both like fruit and also like absolute chemical death. Are you, are you Are you having yeah. a stroke? Do you smell burning toast? <laughs> He's having a stroke. <laughs> oh my god. Please don't. God, I'm having such like severe anxiety with, about whenever I think about having a stroke. Oh. Yeah, I'm having a sniff of the Tamiya right now. It's cold. It, it smells like, uh, you know, those brand new, um, like, uh, what's it called? Like a rubber jacket he brings at the beach. <laughs> Oh, okay, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, like uh, those uh, blow-up uh, air mattresses that you put on the water. Yeah, it's that really kind of rubbery smell. Yeah, uh, that with the uh, turpentine. Yeah. Cleared up my nostrils, though. Well, with, ta with Tamiya alcohol-based ones, like the regular Tamiyas, uh, I just use alcohol. 90 or 70% iso alcohol. But I know at Tamiyas, they have the acrylics and they have the enamels, so... I'm not sure what paints you're playing with, but yeah. Just use alcohol too. Yeah, you can. You get a little bit better clean though with uh, spirits. Guess who managed to get his hands on a lot of packing of alcohol after the lab got shipped their own kind? Um, rhymes with whale. Yes. They needed uh, ethanol, they got shipped isopropanol. And they were like, okay, so iso we now have like five liters of isopropanol, what do we do with them? And I'm like, I'll pay you 20 euros to take it off your hands. <laughs> Did they think you were going to have a party with it or something? Well, no, not with isopropanol, that stuff's going to kill you. <laughs> I, I, I mean, unless you, it's like, it's not methanol. So it's not gonna kill you that hard. I gotta work. I gotta work on telling my jokes. Not make you blind, but it is basically literally just a stronger alcohol than ethanol. So if you drink it, it's gonna be bad. I killer. Yes. Yeah, I, I was joking when I initially said that. As I was saying, I think I have to work on my delivery of jokes because. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm really bad with this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, I was Don't. born two months early, so the part of my brain that's supposed to realize literally when people are sarcastic doesn't really work. No problem. I'm I'm just teasing anyway. But yeah, I mean, they did make a party joke when I said that. <laughs> but it wasn't a party joke. It was me stripping the paint from my armature. And I will endeavor to work on my delivery. Please don't bother. <laughs> it's not your problem, it's mine. It's like feeding steak to your tortoise and your tortoise not liking it. It's not your problem or the steak's problem, it's the tortoise's problem. <laughs> I'm just picturing a tiny tortoise with a proper fucking dinner in front of him. Yeah. Because I was going to ask, is that a common thing to like feed steak to your tortoise? I wish. Like I really realize how steak. many novice reptile owners have no idea that tortoise is a vegetarian. Well, I don't know why, I don't know how, but they don't. Well, because they're dum dums. Pretty straightforward, really. <laughs> dum dums going to do as dum dums going to do. Not much you can do about that. I mean, if you want to... What are you feeding your tortoise? Not that I'm a tortoise owner, but uh, my friend is. And he tells me many things. Oh, like cat food. And they're like, holy shit, that's going to kill it. Like, if if, uh, if you really want to uh, go for that Nobel Prize in uh, gene therapy and shit, uh, remove the dum-dum gene out of people. That's actually possible, but it's going to require a societal overhaul. Yeah, we might be heading We're towards... there, then. Yeah. 
uh, I think that's I, I think that that will garner you a uh, Nobel Prize. So here, here we here we have <laughs> just killer wheel. He has officially removed the tongue. Yeah, got rid of dum dum yeah, syndrome well, out of people. Idiot gene, and we now have, we have to begin the treatment. Yeah, because I think I think that's idiot isn't the gene, right? That's the sad part. Because uh, that's where I think uh, humanity really needs help. I mean, humanity is still smarter than the other animals. Are I've they? Seen, uh, there are two rabbits uh, that live in my yard. Domestic rabbits, because the yard's communal. And uh, we've once had to rescue one of them from the oven. Jeez. No, no, no. The oven wasn't on. What this guy did is crawl into the oven, though. The guy crawled in? The oven was open. Because it's uh, back in the summer when the kitchen door is always open. You have a large communal kitchen. One of these guys, the white one, crawled into the... Well, went through the door, saw an open oven, decided to go into the oven, and then he got his legs stuck uh, in the grate. The white guy. The rabbit. Oh, a white rabbit. Yes. Oh. Then it went stuck in the grate, and then it started. It's like it didn't even scream, but it was there for like an hour before I managed to rescue it. Right. Before we realized there was a rabbit in the oven. I wasn't cooking. I That's wasn't cooking. Screaming. It was late for a tea party. <laughs> yeah, I can see why it's always late for a tea party. These, these are crap jokes, people. <laughs> yeah. I'm fully aware. <laughs> like, like, damn, this animal is so fucking stupid. And, and you know, we also have plenty of waterfall in, uh, here. And the best way to describe geese and, well, the geese is suicidally aggressive. That sounds like a band. Yeah, that, that is a good bad name. Yeah. Suicidal I mean, I've aggressive. seen one of the guys attacking a police horse, and the police horse just kicked it to death once. Well, the horse going to do is the horse going to do, I guess. But like, why do you attack an animal that's not doing anything that's exponentially larger than you are? Size doesn't matter, man. Apparently for geese it doesn't. Nothing matters for geese. No. <clears throat> Here in Canada, cobra chickens are the most dangerous animal, other than black bears. Did you call them a cobra chicken? Cobra chickens, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's, that's what they're, they're called, man. They're fucking cobra chickens. Yeah. Oh, we have swans. Swan? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, they're vicious bastards. Yeah. But yeah. Our swans are pretty chill. I would assume you guys have the same birds in your area. Because I don't think you guys are too far from each other, right? I'm in Netherlands. Yeah, it's not too far. Yeah. But ours, our swans are hungry for infants. The flesh of the innocent? Yeah. <laughs> infants. <laughs> we have, a, we have a, a swans in the university pond. Or really bad parents. They breed every year, and every year they manage to get all of their kids killed. Somebody should call the swarm child services. <laughs> Cobra Chickens Anonymous. <laughs> like how? <laughs> God damn. I'm, Cobra I'm had, it, so had it up to here with these goddamn Cobra Chickens. These motherfucking Cobra Chickens. From the motherfucking plane. To be fair, if a uh, goose flies into the turbine, that's going to be pretty bad. Oh, jeez. It's graphic. Oh, crap. Okay, I have to leave you here, guys. Sorry. I have to do stuff now. You have to leave us here. But how will I get home? 
I'm sorry. <laughs> Again, sorry, it was a crap joke, man. Oh my god, I'm so sorry. I, I just didn't hear it. It's just I have to uh, go to sleep because I have to get up early tomorrow, but thanks a lot for the chat. No problem, dude. Later. Fully base coated uh, Strider thing while we were talking, so that's the absolute best use of your talking I've ever had. Ever? That's quite a quite a compliment. I mean, hypothetically. I don't remember all the times I've used talking. <laughs> Again, I was making crap jokes. Yeah, I know. I tried to reply with a crap joke. <laughs> Okay, but thanks a lot for the chat, and see you next time. Yeah, later, dude. <laughs> Holy fuck, it's only, it's five minutes to two? Or to two, to two hours? God damn, time flew by. And I haven't bought anything since I joined. Wow. A lot of looking. I do lots of looking. Still, I still catch a backhander every once in a while, though. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the higher bro for us, boys. <laughs> you shouldn't look so freaking close. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway. The yuck yucks. Always turn turn up for the yuck yucks. Uh, is Gator Pig Jr. is starting to look like something. Would that something be a Gator Pig? Yeah, Junior. Junior? Yeah, small version. <laughs> I don't know what it's called anymore. <laughs> I don't even know. I call it the Big Beastie Scumdreck, but I mean, that's what it says on the box. Yeah, that is... So I'm. Yeah. I don't know what the other little guy's called, though. The one you're doing. The generic version, I think, is just called like a sludge drake rack or something. A sludge drake or rack? A cobra chicken. Cobra chicken. You like that one, eh? Yep. Right. I will be. I will remember that for the rest of my life. <laughs> Kim's like, what is a gator pig junior? <laughs> Swamp Pop Scum Drake is Scum Drake is actually the guy. Swamp Pop. Oh, Scumdreck is the dude? I thought it was... No, yeah. I thought he was a Swamp Boss. It says Swamp no, Boss... Swamp Boss Scumdreck is the character version. Oh! And it's the dude on top. I thought the beast the was actual, called Scumdreck. Like, animal thing is called a Sludge Raker. Oh, that's less fun. You've ruined my childhood. <laughs> well, we still have the Gator Pig. Yeah. Oh, Kim says it, uh, the, the thing in the Dominion is called the Nash Tooth. Oh, yeah, okay, that's the one. <laughs> yeah, Nash Tooth, the one in Dominion. Yeah, see, I told you it was something, too. <laughs> All right, settle down. Okay, that's like everything with my life. Like, it typically involves something like bashing, smashing, breaking, and then, you know. Crashing? <laughs> So this is the Gator Piglet. It's a Gator Piglet. Ever sweet. Yeah. So then these must be the male versions of them because I don't see any teats on them. Not that I need to. It's just... Well, maybe I do need to. The Gator Teats. Gator Teats. <laughs> <laughs> that, that sounds like a really old hooker out of Florida. <laughs> yeah. It does. So cold. <laughs> She's uh I don't know, gator teats. Yeah. How you doing there, gator teats? <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Uh, 
like the war. It's the golden word. It's the war. Most never call it the war. It's the war. <laughs> I'm gonna use that. As soon as, the, as soon as the old lady gets home, I'm gonna call her a gator teat. See what, she, what the response <laughs> is. I'll probably get my ass kicked. You but. can't call it a gator poo. Gator poon? I said you can't call it a gator pig. <laughs> oh. I thought you said <laughs> gator poon. I was gonna say, holy <laughs> man. Well, two hours in, and I've got two and a half sort of base coated. Ooh. Yeah. Try hard. That's uh, faster than my pants. <laughs> well, we've got dotted dod. Er, god. Oh, I know. Dotted fucking dod shit. I think, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to kind of um, move my way through him, I think. I'm not going to. GW fucks. <laughs> Whoa. What's going on? Whoa. No, I don't, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna get my freaking order my Lord of the Rings stuff for like Easterlings because they're getting more models, and um, they removed the Easterling cavalry from their freaking store in like the last like week. Oh really? Yeah, I mean it just means they're reboxing it so they can re-release something in the like open. Um, you know what they've been doing the Lord of the Rings is just pull it from the store and then they just rebox it and release it. Uh, when they don't have anything to release that weekend. <laughs> but uh, it's like the fucking day I'm like, hmm, yeah, I'm gonna, you know, buy that Lord of the Rings shit I want. And I was like, oh, it's not even freaking there. Oh, yeah, I had the same thing happen when I was uh, supposed to buy a Schmelk. A Schmelk? Oh, just gone back. Schmelk. What's a Schmelk? Oh, no, he's out of stock right now. Okay. And a big combo bash. Or Benadryl tennis match. Take it back. GW stop freaking reboxing shit. You don't sell the kits in your physical stores. You don't need fucking reboxing. But don't they? He's fucking been like aside from like constantly going back to Weird's web store, there hasn't been anything that I've been like I gotta buy. I'm kind of at that point where I I really don't see much out there that I'm like I gotta buy. Which is weird because all these websites are like, you know, buy this much, get, you know, free shit or, you know, discount. And it's just like, eh, I just don't really care. Yeah. The last things that I was, like, really fired up to pick up, and which, which of course, I did, was the Bandai Marines and the Nurgle plushie. That was it. Everything else has been just meh. I think because a lot of it just not, like, pressing stuff you need to get like right there because you know it's in production still yeah and also too so I, like, i've been watching those damn um eldar rumors and uh, i don't know i mean i'm fired up some of them feel yeah. too good to be true it's like i'm kind of like into it. i'll believe it when i see it yeah yeah exactly and I mean, like, it's got to be a ways away because G Dubs has not done any kind of teasers or anything like that. So, at least as far as we've seen, anyway. Because even once they start doing like um, releases and trailers and shit like that, like it's still months away. Yep. And so we have not even seen that shit yet. So even if these rumors are. Incredible. Spitting out rumors where people are like, I saw the codex, and it's like, well, this is odd. Wait. Very specific and weird stuff that you're saying you saw in this codex. Yeah. Who dat? Oh, Sir Pork, the second of the line. Cheered with five bits. Thank you, Sir Pork. Ooh. What a potato doing? What a, what the potato doing? 
What the potato? What the potato do though? I don't know. It's a bunch of doggies. Cheered with bits anyway. What that cobra chicken do though? <laughs> cobra chicken. Yeah, we need a cobra chicken emote. Yeah. We need more cobra chickens. But seriously though, do if you, you ever need... if you ever come to Canada, yeah. you gotta watch out, man, because them cobra chickens will get you. Oh yeah. Them honking cobra chickens. Yeah. They're no joke. Do man. any of you have like a uh, model that is uh, like you have to paint this? Um. Like a favorite model that you just have to paint before you die. Oh, I see what you mean. Um, that I haven't bought yet. It's just uh, well, maybe you have bought it. Who knows? Um. I thought that was Sanguinius, and I bought him. I bought the special edition one at the time, twenty nineteen. He's been sitting in the box. Yeah, I don't know. If, like, year. I'm trying to think if there's any models that have been. I mean, uh, periodically, I get like. Oh my god, I'd love to paint that model as soon as I see it, right? And, like, there's lots. Because, like, even with, like, um, well, like, these Deepkin. As soon as I saw these, I was like, damn, I gotta get these. Because they're pretty damn cool. Um, and same with um, the uh, the other elves. The, um... <sighs> yeah, yeah, the Lumineth, yeah. With the, with the uh, mountain cow dude. Uh, I thought that was really cool. But I mean, there's many where I'm like, cool, and I want to get these, but then when it comes time to actually buy them, it's like, uh, do I actually want to? Oh, I know. Yes, there is a model that I've wanted to paint for a long time. Never got around to it. Still haven't gotten around to it yet, but um, somebody sent it to me. And uh, when, it, when I was first starting out, you know, doing this independently, and it was the, um, the owl with a little elf rider, I believe. On, um, it used to be uh, sold through Cool Mini or Not, and it was this big owl, and it had a rider on it. You know, it's a pretty big kit. I have it. I have not touched it yet. Um, fuck, it's failing me now. Who sent it to me? They sent me a whole bunch of models, and yeah, it was, it was really awesome. Um, fuck, I can't remember who the hell it was now. I feel bad now because I can't remember. Oh god! Uh, I did a little, uh, did a little search on it. That is amazing. The uh, owl, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a really nice model. They had another one. I think it was an uh, eagle. It was cool, but the owl one is just really cool. It's badass. And I have I it. Who it is. But I haven't, uh, I haven't touched it yet. I haven't even assembled it. And that's one that you know, when I first saw that way back in the day, because that's that model is pretty old. And yeah, when I saw that one way back in the day, I was like, "Oh man, I've I've got to get that because I've got to paint it," you know. So yeah, it's one of those rare instances. Nowadays, I suppose I'm probably pretty spoiled because um, this shit just shows up at my door, and so <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm you know grateful and everything like that. But yeah, it's like sometimes it's you know sometimes I want to get onto my own projects and that stuff showing up at the door it's like but 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 i got things to do i mean i guess liberty prime liberty prime from fallout we say almost there oh i'm not familiar with that you familiar with fallout yep so it's a miniature scene okay and i have all the photos of the two of them except for Oh, it's a beat boot. He's, he's an expensive model, and it ships from a uh, UK company, so the shipping is kind of up there. So. Um, that's about it. Yeah. Mine is the Hell Pit Abomination. The Hell Pit? Skaven. Uh, the Hell Pit Abomination from uh, Skaven. Oh, okay. Yeah, he's like a big ogre thing. Or a mutant thing. Yeah, just, just rat. Yeah. Plural. Sir Pork. Cobra chicken? Question mark? Uh, a goose. Canadian Goose. 
Canadian goose specifically. It's the the dangerous Canadian goose. It's a very dangerous animal. It uh, commands uh, respect in Canada. Not just because it's named a Canadian goose, but <laughs> anyway. Huckahey. I eat kangaroo and it's really good fat free meat, but more fish weekly than meat. More fish weekly than meat. I guess if we were to get in the GW models, I guess it would just be the ogre line and I want to paint it, but it's just kind of one of those things where like the investment and then buying everything for it. Yeah. Oh, like the ogre more tribes? Yeah, just, yeah. Yeah, I've had so much fun painting up my ogre army. Ogres? The ogres. Sir Pork, Conrad Kurz is a good looking model paint. That's. I, oh, jeez, please. Oh, five bits. Thank you again, Sir Pork. With doggy cat or hamster? Hamster cat? Oh, the little animated emotes. Uh, I just noticed that. I want animated emotes. Yeah, Conrad Curse. That's the Primark for Night Lords, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the Skaven are the only race, could be me, that would fit right into 40k. Yeah, there was talk that um, they were going to incorporate uh, Skaven, or, you know, the well, the Skavens, uh, into 40k. A lot of people suspected that the Harud were going to be that uh, we're gonna fit that bill because uh was it the third edition rule book it had that diagram of all the little different aliens and there's the one that's a little cloaked figure and has a big long rat tail and it's called a harud and everybody thought that that was going to be the introduction to skaven into 40k at least that's the way the rumors used to go back way back when Kim, finish the models I've been doing while you've been streaming, and I think I get uh, I think I get a start a few more. <laughs> yeah, what time are we at? Holy cramoles, it's almost quarter after. I guess uh, we're getting done. Jeez Louise, barf and sheep, cobra chicken. That's <laughs> I've seen that on the Discord. Was, holy shit. That's almost as frightening as the actual thing. That's what they look like, right? Yeah, that's exactly what they look like. Just a little bit more, a little less color in the belly. That's it. That's cobra chicken. <laughs> I think you should have did like a, a proper uh, cobra with a chicken body. <laughs> That's all I could find. Yeah. Well, I didn't dig deep, so. Oh. Well then. All right, I'll do one more model and then we'll call her a day. Well, for the, as far as this is concerned. I still got more shit to do. I gotta finish my model. I'm working on. I missed the deadline. I seen a bunch of people are already posting about it. How dare you miss this deadline? Yeah, well, it showed up a little late. Um, and it just it, it just never fails when uh, like there's a project that I want to get done within the time span and you know and then of course a bunch of other shit comes up and it just you know everything just utilizes up my time and it's bleh. it's annoying but it sounds like I'm making excuses and I don't like to make excuses No excuses, kids. No excuses. Play like a champ. That's your dime store wisdom for the day. I'm actually kind of surprised that this Turbo Dark is going on pretty nicely considering that usually whenever I lay it on especially if I'm doing it by brush I like to have kind of like how I do metallics normally where you put down a glossy surface and then start laying metallics down 
I'm actually liking how this is looking. And that's just after one coat. I'll more than likely do Ooh. two coats before it's all said and done. But even after one coat, I mean, you can see so much of the color there and the shininess and yeah. Really fun colors, I like them. Not that I'm selling this shit, but I am a fan. Yeah, I think I'm gonna have to retire this brush. I think I've taken it past the point. Freaking hairs are slowly coming out. Oh yeah, look at all the cripes. I don't know if you guys can even see that, but uh, let's see if we can get it focus. I'm gonna put it in home. Yeah. No, it's, it's some of the bristles. Yeah, are starting to fray. I, again, like this brush, I've had this since these guys started, so. It's gotten a lot of work. It's a number one. I've been using it for forever, you know. But I think it's time. Yeah, look at this. More hairs are starting to splay out. Yeah, she's nearing the end of her days. She'll get relegated to menial tasks soon enough. I mean, base coating, all I'm doing is base coating with it, but usually like a little bit more control when I'm base coating and this just feels like it's kind of just going at wherever it wants which is not ideal These models are fun. I, I forgot how much I really like these models and how interesting they are. Pain in the ass for these back hook thingies on their backs, but yeah, I like the look of these little guys. They're just interesting. Uh, Sir Pork. Way the brush monkey thingy. He looked like Mega Mind. <laughs> Oh, the figure? Yeah, kind of, right? The blue skin with a little symbol on the thing? Is that what we're talking about? I don't know. How come you sounded like you were doing a voice? Huh? Because low battery. Yeah. It sounded like he was doing like a, a voice. This is, um, you know, the thing, and um, that's what it sounded like he was doing. Okay. <laughs> Someone needs to plug him in the wall. <laughs> paint so i think i'll stop right there i want to eat out for dinner p p aki o yeah peace all righty yeah I, <laughs> he left too before i could get him to do the word of wisdom for the day anyway uh i want to thank you guys for uh tuning in today um painting along Big thank you to Boop, Killer Whale, and of course Barfing Sheep, who's been here the entire time. Uh, I think uh, our conversation with Killer Whale probably ate up quite a bit of the, uh, of the stream today, I think. Well, well, we all learned something, didn't we? Oh, yeah, no, I, I, I like, no, I, 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 I'm not like, you know, oh, he's a bad guy or anything because he's doing this, mm. and you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I mean, it's, you know. But 
these I feel a lot of times these kinds of questions don't get asked enough that's kind of where I come out on that kind of stuff it's you know to not sound too cliche and if a killer whale if you're watching the end of this or whatever you know it's kind of like um, you know the uh, line from Jurassic Park right scientists asking whether or not they can do it and never ask themselves if they should do it and then realistically people need to ask themselves really is this something we should be doing because it's again it tailoring genetics of anything plant or animal just feels like meddling and meddling never gets people anywhere and it can usually end have disastrous results we'll just see what happens to san diego yeah you know just it's just you know i don't know it's just it's just, it's just craziness you know it's uh i don't agree with it um the world is chaotic enough without us trying to unravel all the threads but anyway well thank you uh, sir park for the bits and for the comments want to thank you guys for watching uh any last words of wisdom there uh, sheep yeah respect the cobra chicken respect the cobra chicken exactly because otherwise you know you'll get bit and you know i don't know get sodomized by the chicken i guess i don't know you're gonna have a bad time you're gonna have a bad time well uh, yeah I, I yeah i guess right <laughs> And of course, Kim says, remember to shave your nuts. Yes. Just like take care of your brushes, they'll take care of you. you shave your nuts and they'll be smooth for you. Like quail eggs. Or skinned grapes? No, that conjures up a fucking awful picture. Uh, yeah, they shouldn't be like skinned grapes. No, they shouldn't be like skinned grapes. Um, I've got nothing else. Quail eggs. Hard-boiled quail eggs. There we go. With just a little bit of give. Not too much. But not just too... Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit of give. That's all it takes. All right, let's get the hell out of here. Get some more painting done. I'm going to go eat. And, yeah. I don't know. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm back on tomorrow. So, anybody who wants to uh, join me tomorrow for Way of the Brush... Feel free. Or don't. I don't care.